Good morning. I'm Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona Gila County Cooperative Extension, and I want to welcome everybody to join us for our Garden and Country Extension webinar. Today we are talking about how to grow a winter vegetable garden, growing a winter vegetable garden with Kim Stone, who is a horticulturalist. And Kim, I looked this word up, horticulturalist and horticulturalist, and both seem like they were valid words. So I don't know which way to do it. But I've always anyway, used I, horticulturalist. I know, and I, I just chose, chose this one here, but I, I was gonna talk about that with you and I forgot. So here we go. A little bit about our webinars. We have a weekly Zoom webinar. They're 60 minutes or less. Thursday's at 11, so here we are. Kim did tell me he needs to leave at noon, so we will be looking to shut down at that, by that time. Um, we feature a variety of horticultural and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. Um, if that works for anybody outside of Gila County, well, please come, here you are, and talking about a winter garden, so many places have great opportunities for that. Um, a recording of this will be posted at the at extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. If you look for what's called the Garden and Country webpage, you'll find um, that the recordings are all up to date. I've got the septic tank talk from last week already posted. And um, also want to let you know that the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Here's our agenda. Um, thank you so much much for those of you who joined early, um, listen in on the chat that Kim and I were having. Uh, I'm Chris Jones, I'm your moderator, providing your welcome at present. The topic today is growing a winter vegetable garden with Kim Stone. Uh, he has about a half hour uh, PowerPoint presentation to share with us. Uh, when that's over, I'll provide the evaluation link. It's already in the chat box, but please go to the evaluation link and let us know how we're doing and give suggestions for more talks. We will have a question and answer discussion time with, with Kim on that. I'll help moderate that. And so if you have questions as you go, just put them into the uh, chat box. You can put them into the Q&A too, but the chat box basically feed them in there and we'll give those quest questions to Kim as we finish. We'll seek to wrap up by noon and end the call. This is our presenter. Um, Kim Stone is a retired horticulturist, see I got it spelled the other way again, and arborist at the retired from Boyce Thompson Arboretum and he calls himself an avid organic vegetable gardener. And so with that Kim and your pomegranates behind, behind you I see, I'll stop the share and you can take up, bring up your slides and you've got the show. There we go. Perfect. How about, how about let's start at the beginning? That's the best place. Well, hi everybody. I'm as, to start. <laughs> as, as Chris uh, so ably introduced, my name is Kim Stone, and uh, I'll give you a quick background on, on me. You know, an avid, avid uh, organic gardener. I probably started when I was <clears throat> back in the early 80s and I was the product of the, the sort of the back to the land mother of news movement. And this was something that I was just, I was into 120%. Uh, I had every issue of mother Earth news starting from the first one in 1970 all the way to, I mean, I had dozens and dozens. I'm not sure what the last one was, you know, organic uh, gardening magazine, the Rodell publication, all of that. I used to, um, I had a, I was not a market garden, but I had a, a very, very productive garden. It was almost self, self-sufficient in where I lived up at uh, top of the world. If anybody know where that is, that's between, about a midway between Superior and uh, Miami, AZ, Arizona, about 4,600 feet elevation. And, you know, I grew just about everything, both in summer and winter. I pickled, I dehydrated, I canned. I used to have sprouts growing in cafeteria trays on my windowsill. I farmed worms. I actually had worm bins inside my house. Um, I, uh, there was an apple. The top of the world is actually, this where I lived was the Pinal Ranch. And the Pinal Ranch is a 160 acre apple orchard. It was planted back in 1910 and 1915. And so we were able to pick apples like crazy there. I, I burned wood up there and, and burned all apple wood. 
And I actually farmed those apples one year. And for another two years, I, I bought the crop and sold them out on the side of the road. If any of you ever drove by, you know, almost 35 years ago and saw a sign that said Adam's apples, well, that was me selling apples. And then I started at BTA at Boyce Thompson Arboretum in 88. And that brings me pretty much to the present. And what I, what I started to do from the very beginning is to keep really, really good detailed notes about what I was growing. And this has been a, a real kind of walk down memory lane for me in this presentation because I've been able to go through those notes and really see what I did back in the last nearly 40 years and some of the successes and failures and all the various techniques and, and all the different things I tried and, and here and there, a lot of stuff I'd actually forgotten about. So this has actually been a great experience pulling it all together. Well, that's, that's me sort of in a nutshell. And to be, to be honest, when working at the Arboretum as long as I did, I kept really good notes to about 2005, 2006. That's about 20 years. And then at working eight hours at the Arboretum or more, 10 hours a day forever and ever, I sort of lost my steam a little bit on, on doing my own vegetable gardening at, at, at my house. But I still, I still you know, persisted in doing it and keeping pretty good notes, but maybe not on the scale that I did in the first uh, 20 years or so. But I'm still, I'm still hard at it, and I'll be showing you more or less today what I've been doing here in the past few years. Well, what I'll cover today is, I'll just read these off to you. Cool is better than hot. Winter's a great season to grow vegetables. These are the veggies that I've um, successfully grown, creating a growing space, building a raised bed, um, making a soil mix, planting, irrigation, fertilization, frost protection, what Chris and I were just uh, lamenting about, environment control, harvest, and then transitioning to a summer winter garden. Um, the winter garden is just a joy to grow because it is so easy. It's a really simple thing. It's, it's you can grow a great variety of mainstay vegetables. I mean, we're not growing really fruiting plants by any means. You're growing flowering plants such as brassicas and broccolis and things. Uh, but you're mainly growing greens, things that you use as sort of mainstay items to complement a meal. It uses far less water than a summer garden, which is my favorite part of a winter garden. In good, in good rainfall, good norm, normal rainfall years, you can practically get away with very little supplemental irrigation at all. That's kind of an exaggeration, but it's just a much mellower atmosphere. It's nothing like fighting it every day like growing a summer garden. And, and, it, and it's really easy to grow for a, a novice gardener, which is really great. And of course, you have the freshest possible produce and you have this beautiful green garden during a potentially dismal sort of cold winter dormant looking months. Disadvantages, you have to protect it from frost and snow and really, you know, kind of cold uh, winters when you might get some particularly cold uh, temperatures. And just there are some few pest uh, issues, mainly uh, aphids have a tendency to emerge really heavily in the spring. I've had some problems with sow bugs in the past too, fairly minor. Uh, now growing, picking a, a growing space, this is a beginning class by the way, so I, I know a lot of you have probably been doing this forever. Uh, some of you might, this might be your, your first one, you're looking for ideas, but some of the things that I, that I have shown to be successful is picking a full sun location. And I like to get a minimum of six to seven hours of full sun daily. And that's, that's really kind of what you're looking for in practically any kind of a crop. I and mean, when you talk about full sun, getting six or seven hours of full sun is almost maxing out sometimes what a plant uh, can actually, what a plant actually needs to grow. You want to choose a location that can be fenced from, from critters, cattle, rabbits, and javelina. That's, rabbits are one of my uh, biggest uh, nemesis. Also javelina, they can destroy everything in, in one night. <clears throat> Impossible place in a location that you can watch from a window inside your house. This is, to me, I really like to get up in the morning and look out the window and see how things are going without even having to step out of my house. So if there's any way you can do that or open a door, if it's rainy or if it's a nasty day, you can kind of peek out there and check things out without actually having to, to walk outside. Because sometimes walking outside, if it's cold, if it's rainy, if it's bad weather, sometimes ah, I don't want to do it. But if it's just, if it's really close to your house, it's easy to sort of keep, a, um, keep an eyeball on things. Located close to a water source, obviously either a hose and or an automatic trip system. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Be sure it's uh, easy access to any equipment, particularly wheelbarrows for hauling bags of mulch and topsoil and that kind of thing in and out. And then of course, consider creating a raised bed, which is what this uh, I'm gonna focus on in this webinar. There's a lot of advantages to it. It's a really efficient use of space. You know, you're, you're, you're keeping really straight sides. You're, it's clean, you're containing all the soil. Uh, you keep plants off the ground and a step up. 
from wandering creatures. It's not as easy to just sort of walk along and graze as you go. You actually have to, you have to climb a vertical barrier. Uh, it makes it easy for you to attach hoops and frames for plastic and shade cloth, which I'll talk about a little bit. You don't have to bend down as far. Okay? That's one good thing about it. Uh, it's a lot better moisture control uh, with a raised bed. And you can have a closer spacing of plants, particularly if you've got a pretty good vertical uh, space for planting. Now building, I'm gonna run through this really quick. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. This is just the way that I did it. I just built a, four, a little bit over four by four foot bed. And I used two by 12 untreated lumber, uh, three and a half inch deck screws. I used uh, one inch, just to show you right here, I used one inch PVC here for putting the, uh, the one half inch uh, class 200 PVC into. I used class 200 instead of schedule 40 because it bends. Schedule 40 is really stiff and it won't bend. Uh, and also use, uh, I use uh, Schedule 40 PVC for the actual frame, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then miscellaneous PVC fittings um, for completing it. Uh, mine's real basic. I just clamped all these things together with a pipe clamp, drilled pilot holes, and used three and a half inch deck screws to screw these things together. They're not going anywhere. And I utilized, uh, like I said, one inch PVC here with these brackets. Uh, above and below. I try to keep the top of the PVC uh, just a little bit above the frame so it doesn't get filled with soil, or at least just above the soil line. And then it's having these, these corner posts also makes it easy to, to create some sort of a, of, a, of a support. And you can do this a couple different ways. You can create hoops that run across like so, or you can do hoops that kind of cross over the top. To me, it just seemed like this was a little bit stronger. To me, it seemed like it had more, because um, when you have, when you have, you can, you can, this kind of thing can happen if you can see my hands back and forth when you've got them parallel. But running them over top of each other seems to be uh, a lot more sturdy of a, of a structure. Now this is, if I had to do this over again, I would use three quarter inch PVC. On this one, this is the one I did this year. I used half inch uh, schedule 40 PVC and you notice it's kind of sagging here, right here in the middle. And you almost need another support or need to have something a little bit stronger. So if I had to do over again, I think I would use three quarter inch uh, schedule 40 PVC. But it's a real easy way to build a frame that will support either shade cloth or plastic uh, or uh, anything you want to put on it. Uh, Remay, some people use this, which is kind of a light uh, row cover you might have heard of. Uh, you need some some sort of some sort of support, and this is kind of my next generation to using the hoops by building this frame. Plus, what's nice is that the hoops give you more space on the outside, so that, you know. I mean, the hoops hoops are curving in, so you lose that edge space. Whereas if you do a rectangular frame, you keep all of that corner space, so it's the same dimensions as the box all the way up. A corner detail. Uh, you can buy all these fittings and they're pretty straightforward on how to put this kind of stuff together. I don't glue the joints just in case I change my mind and I decide, you know, this wasn't a really good idea after all. So, or if you want to take the thing down seasonally or if you, whatever you want to do, you're able to recycle everything without having to just kind of cut it or, or throw it away. Now, <clears throat> what do we put in the beds? There is a huge range and I was looking through my notes from, from 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, 20 years ago about the kind of soil mixes I was using. And I used all kinds of soil mixes, as it turns out. And I seem to be successful using a lot of different recipes. Now, one of the easiest ways of doing it, and I thought this was going to be the most expensive, and it sort of is, but you can buy actually pre-mixed raised garden potting soil, which is just a mixture of compost peat moss, uh, coconut career, I think I'm pronouncing that right, a career, uh, and vermicula, it's an Indian word, so I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that. Um, East Indian, continent of, of India, and vermiculite. So it's all pre-mixed, it comes in a bag. I paid, the, our local nursery is, is uh, uh, Golden Hill Nursery. I paid $11 per bag, and it takes about 10 bags to fill up one by four, four by four bed, which is what I'm using. So it'd be about $110. That's a lot, but if not, if you weren't doing that, you'd have to break it down and put these component parts into it, which who knows when you're talking about chipping and picking everything up and it, it might end up costing just about as much. What I ended up using though is a, <clears throat> just, I was looking for a kind of a, 
a website that, that showed that they were successful with a really, with a particular potting mix. And I came up upon this website called Weedem and Reap, which that's, <laughs> it's a great title. Say that quick three times. So for the past couple of years, I have been using this. And what is what they recommend is 50% compost. Now, back when I was hot and heavy into this, I made all of my own compost. I made all my own compost for 20 or more years. And I used any combination of anything from grass clippings to, to, uh, to leaves to, to kitchen scraps. And I used, usually my nitrogen source was, was fresh horse manure, which around our areas is really easy to get. As long as you have a pickup truck, I used to shovel a lot of that stuff and uh, used, used it to make compost. You should always compost all of your horse manure and you know, don't ever use it for fresh dough. There's some exceptions to that. I found that horse manure doesn't burn anyways near as, as easily as, as cow manure does. It doesn't smell as bad either. And if you, look at, if you look at horse manure, it almost looks like it's already composted in certain ways. <clears throat> so uh, for the 50% compost portion and a 50% coconut coir, uh, there, I used a combination for mine. I just used bag mulch, composted steer manure, and potting soil uh, for my particular mix. And then for the uh, coconut career, I, I bought this from Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, which is now called Grow Organic. <clears throat> I think they also go by Peaceful Valley sometimes because that's the way a lot of us old timers, oops, I just called myself an old timer. That's the way a lot of us uh, remember it back when we used to deal with them. And I, I bought all my stuff from them literally 40 years ago, so they've been around a while. You get this stuff in bales. If you've never used it before. It's like a square foot bale and it comes out in flakes and you peel the flakes <clears throat> and then you put them in a container, fill it with a certain amount of water so it can hydrate and it'll about triple in size. So one cubic foot makes about, uh, makes about three cubic feet. And also with this, it's a, you know, if you've got compost in there, you've got some nutrients, but it's, you need to also add some supplemental nutrients to it, some amendments to this soil especially because it's in certain respects, it's kind of sterile, uh, except for the compost, certainly the, qua the coconut uh, hus husks are. By the way, that's where coconut coir comes from. It's like, it's coming from a recycled product of coconuts. I don't think it's the outer part, it's certainly not the inner part. I think there's like a, a center region in there where they get that coconut coir from. So I use worm castings, uh, azomite rock uh, dust, which is for trace minerals, and also a mycorrhizal uh, fungi the fungi uh, root growth enhancer. <clears throat> and these were both relatively um, expensive, uh, but really expensive for shipping. I think when I bought everything from Grow Organic the first time, I paid like $45 in shipping. It's crazy. If you can get, if you've got prime shipping on Amazon, definitely the way to go. <laughs> See if you can find it because the shipping will be free. Alternative soil mixes, as I was saying, when I looked through my old notes, um, I was just using a screen topsoil from a commercial source. This is something that was sold at a concrete plant. Actually, I think they, that they derived from screening rock uh, that they made for concrete. So it was pretty good mineral rich stuff. Then I would add homemade and commercial compost at about a one to three ratio to it. And, and, and days gone by, back in the 80s, jojoba, as if you remember, was a huge craze. And you could, there were jojoba um, oil plants in Apache Junction. It was one that I know of. And I used to go out there and get huge burlap bags of jojoba meal. And that's what I used for oh, probably four or five years as my main fertilizer source. It's got about a 5% uh, <clears throat> nitrogen uh, component in it. And I used a lot of bone meal and kelp. I love powdered kelp, liquid kelp too, if you can get it. And I had great results with everything. So, you know, whether the soil mix itself is gonna be make you or break you, you can probably get away with that as long as you use a lot of organic matter. <clears throat> and I also like to use an organic um, fertilizer. This is uh, Job's and, oops, it looks like it's covered up here, the front cover of it. But Job's comes in a couple of different formulations. The 274 is, I think, mainly for tomatoes and fruit growing crops, but you can also get a 444, which is better probably for leafy. It's got a little bit higher, higher nitrogen. It's about a cup per 100 square feet. Uh, so I would be using for mine, I, um, quite a bit less than that because I was only four by four is only about, uh, no, this was, this is actually, this is a misprint. I think this is for 10 square feet. So it was, I, I'm sorry about that. I think that's 10 square feet. So I'd be using maybe two cups for the beds that I made. A jojoba, again, um, about 5% nitrogen, almost impossible to get now. I don't think you could get it. Kelp, I love if you can find it. 
And that's, you can, actually, you can get that fairly readily. Bone meal, I love, and cottonseed meal. Actually, when I couldn't get jojoba meal anymore, I started using cottonseed meal. and had really good results that I, that I saw in my notes. For liquid fertilizer, I like to use, um, uh, I like to use uh, just fish emulsion. And you can get this, fish emulsion also comes with, with the mixture with kelp, which is a little bit more expensive, uh, but it also is really, really good stuff. Uh, I think I'm mixing about a half cup. I think you can go between two and four ounces per gallon of water and, and putting it on every two to three weeks during the growing season. Stinks to high heaven if you've ever used fish emulsion. It, don't get it on your clothes. Uh, you will, yeah, you will be smelling like fish for, for quite a while. So make sure you have the right clothes on when you're spending it. You inevitably get it on you when you're using it. So just keep that in mind. And of course, good old fashioned miracle grow, especially when soils are cold during the winter and you're really trying to get something really started a little bit to grow a little bit faster. Sometimes, as I say, goosing it with miracle grow, which is a soluble fertilizer, it doesn't really need to be transformed in any way to be available. Uh, for the plants within the soil when it's really, when the soil is really cool. And you can get some almost instant results from, from using miracle Well, let's go. Chris, how are we doing on time? It is 11.20. Oh boy, I better start moving here. Better, planting, yes, um, go ahead. <laughs> uh, planting, uh, I, I have a very limited plant palette because I don't have really a whole lot of space right now. I just have about 40 uh, square feet of growing space, a little bit less than that, 35. And I've been growing lettuce, chard, kale, spinach, arugula. Uh, I did, have not been growing cilantro and parsley only because it is so available and so inexpensive in the grocery stores and you can get it in, in seconds. Carrots, I have not tried growing. I just threw that on there. That's a good one for this time of year. Uh, you can see some of the, I think these are lettuce seedlings coming up, not completely sure. Uh, from planting, best thing to do is starter sets when you're talking about brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and collards. Uh, get to either start them on your own six or eight weeks before you're ready to plant in your own seedling trays or get them from a nursery uh, all ready to, to put in. These are like in little three inch pots ready to go. And this, I just took this at, at our local nursery, a Golden Hill nursery, and these are ready to buy today. Timing, it's good to try to get everything in as quickly as possible before. Uh, I, I've waited till October and November and been very disappointed in how long it took for me to harvest the plants. And uh, it just took takes forever for things to grow once the soil starts to cool down. So it's a really good idea, I think, at our elevation, I think, to start planting around mid-September, about the same time they start overseeding golf courses with, with, uh, with uh, whoops, whoops, yeah, with, uh, for, for ryegrass, for, for uh, growing uh, winter grass on golf courses. Um, Daytime uh, and nighttime temperatures are a lot cooler, which is nice. And things are already starting to cool down. We have some daytime temperatures are still high, but if you can notice the nights are starting to cool down considerably. The soil is still warm, so seeds germinate quickly and transplants root a lot faster. And, you, and the best thing is you want plants to be well established and actively growing before cold slows everything down. It's nice to get plants really going, really up to almost a mature, not a mature, but a half mature state so that you can start harvesting. And even though the growth slows down, you still have something that you can really start to, to use as, as time goes on without having to wait and wait and wait. And I've used plastic to accelerate things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The book I highly recommend over all others, this is the one that started me off. I think the first printing was 1973. The latest edition was just a couple of years ago. Uh, I suggest buying the, the spiral bound version. It's easy to kind of play open and, and, and use that way. But this is, this, this is an incredible book. Uh, really, I, I, I can't recommend it enough. And it's got, I just measured our soil temperature just for um, the heck of it. And I did it yesterday morning at 8 a.m. And at four inches deep, my soil was still 76 degrees. Again, this is in Globe. And if you're living down the lower deserts, and quite possibly a lot warmer. Plus, I use 50% shade cloth, which also keeps the soil cooler. And just to give you some examples here, this is a page from the book. Uh, the, uh, this is for germination, minimum temperatures, the optimum range, and the maximum range for lettuce and for chard. As uh, this, this book has it for all the vegetables that we're talking about here. And then here also uh, is the, for cool season crops, we're also talking about the optimal growing ranges. And that's really, if you look at these temperatures here, for a lot of these cool seasons crops, it's 60 to 65 degrees. That's pretty cool. 
And that's kind of where these things are being grown in California and all, where you've got temperatures that aren't going a whole lot above 70, 75. But um, what you can do is compensate for that. If things are getting a lot cooler than that, you can compensate by using plastic. A lot of people don't use plastic. If you get a good head start on it, sometimes you can get away with it, especially if you don't have a really cold winter. And I just threw this in here to, I to, uh, just got this off the US climate data and to show you some of the highs, the, the average highs and the average lows and the, and the rainfall. Globe gets, believe it or not, 16, 17 inches of rain. And as Chris and I were talking about, for the entire monsoon period on my rain gauge, we've had three quarters of an inch this summer. That's it, 0.75 inches. We've got five more days of monsoon <laughs> season left. About there we go. percent of rain. <laughs> there we go. So anyway, that gives you some sort of idea, at least in, in globe and uh, pretty good growing temperatures there when you look at the averages. Uh, I like to, mine is just makes sense to me. I divided everything into uh, one foot square grids and I like to pound nails in every foot and then take uh, some string and put it across. It just helps me to keep track of things a little bit better, especially when you're planting uh, and I always overplant seeds and then thin. Every, everybody hates to thin. It's really tough to do it. But uh, you, I'd probably plant 100 seeds and thin them out to one or two in, in some of these, depending on how many plants I want to have per square. Uh, for the brassicas and lettuce, they get pretty big. And so I like to put them one to a square. And some things like arugula, parsley, cilantro, carrots, you can put them a little bit closer. Uh, remember, you've got 12 inches of, of, of growing depth, too, and in perfectly friable, nice, beautiful soil. And one of the things I can't recommend highly enough is to create a labeled map for everything that you plant. And this is, an, this is just a screenshot of one of my, this is from 1984. And if you notice, I've just got some quick sketches of what I planted. Uh, kind of, I, I noticed I put alternate planting, which, alternate planting, which gives a little bit more equidistant spacing, which I think that makes sense. Um, when I started my horse manure pile and I started a new compost system and realized that, that I, I didn't have enough volume and the next time I'm going to make sure to have instead of three by three, I'm going to have four by four foot uh, volume so I can build up a lot more heat and the compost will heat up quicker. So one of the best things about taking notes is that you, you learn every single year and you take detailed notes, you know what worked this year, you know what didn't work, you can, you can put in notes about what I might want to do next year, what might be helpful. Uh, it's, you can brainstorm and plus you just keep really good track of what you did. You can keep track of how many plants I did last year. Did we, was that too many? Should I plant? Did we eat more lettuce than we thought we were going to eat? How about tomatoes? Was it not enough tomatoes? Too many? Sorry, I keep going back. So anyway, keeping good notes is really important. There's a list of things that I like to think about there. Irrigation. Now, irrigation is this is a great time of year for not using a whole lot of water. That's one of my, my, rain, my main things for, for making a winter garden is because it really is a, a very efficient use of water. In Arizona, summer gardens are a terrible, terrible use of water, in my opinion. It's so you have to fight things so much. I mean, agriculture, I just read the latest statistics, agriculture uses 70% of, of Arizona's water for, for commercial agriculture. And when I, when I start to add up what it actually takes to grow a summer garden, I mean, it's, it's $5 a tomato. And it's hardly an exaggeration. But winter gardens, really a very efficient use of water. So when you're, when you're watering, there's really no substitute for using a, a, using a hose to water the surface to get everything established. Uh, you want to keep everything really moist for, you know, to the seedlings uh, emerge. Uh, continue to hand water as you notice new growth starting. And then if you can, I, I like to put in a drip system. And I, I use a... a drip line that's a quarter inch and it has emitters, quarter inch in diameter, has emitters every six inches. And I like to space it about six inches apart. And I anchor it down there with little uh, wire clips that I make just out of galvanized wire and I, about six inches long and I bend them around in a U shape and that, that holds them in place. I like to use plastic and plastic does a lot of things. It, uh, you can get your, if you get a late start in planning, like last year, I didn't get them until October. The year before it was November, so it was really bad. And, and it helps to, to uh, speed up growth in general. It helps to keep the air, both the air temperature and the soil temperature warmer. It helps to maintain higher humidity, which is great. It keeps out the squirrels and the birds, which uh, birds can sometimes be as, much, as pesky as, as, uh, as squirrels when, when it comes to nibbling on things. Uh, it's good to have in case there's supposed to be real, real, real low temperatures uh, that could set everything back. Or maybe even though the, a lot of these plants will take super cold temperatures, if you get a super 
uh, heavy freeze, heavy frost, uh, you might be a good idea to cover them. And just be ready to remove it every day because things can heat up super quickly. Environment control, I spend most of my time, Chris and I were just talking about this, I spend a lot of my time, most of my time doing this with the garden. Um, I've had really good luck with, uh, with you know, barbed wire for cows, can't beat that. Rabbits, I like to use half inch hardware cloth. I've had terrible luck and I really don't recommend using uh, chicken wire. Chicken wire, I don't know how many, now it's, I won't exaggerate, I've, I've killed a number of snakes uh, that have gotten into chicken wire and they get their way into one or two of the uh, hexagonal sections. They can't get out and they end up uh, dying in the sun. It's happened more than once and I don't use it at all anymore. Havelina, um, when I used to fight them at the top of the world a lot more than here, I had barbed wire, then I went and used to, to woven wire and, and, and welded wire fencing. And finally, I had to put two by fours nailed down below so they wouldn't dig below them. And that finally kept them out. Of course, you always want to lock the gate. Not lock it, but close it, make sure it's closed. Rock squirrels, Chris and I were just talking about, are a big, uh, big problem here where I live. Um, I use a live trap, I have a hard trap. They're pretty easy to trap. Uh, my favorite bait is to use uh, pepitas, walnuts, and sometimes a few raisins mixed in there, seem to attract them and get them pretty quick. Uh, my last point here is a really important one. Tree netting uh, is, I guess it's okay if you put it on the tree during when the trees, when the, when the uh, fruit is maturing, but once, the, once you've picked and once you get that stuff off as quickly as possible, it is a terrible, terrible killer of hummingbirds. And I don't wanna tell you how many hummingbirds that were caught in, in my net um, two years ago. It was, it was really, really sad. I'm, I'm just not using it anymore, but if I do, I'm being ultra careful with it. This is my garden, such as it is, not the prettiest thing in the whole world. You can see the pipe that I talked about, the two by 12 planks. You can see the hardware cloth that I have put all the way around it with rebar stakes. And around the outside, you can see the posts here. I actually have about three by three uh, wire that's that's welded wire for keeping rabbits out but it doesn't do a really good job of rabbits so i i beefed it up on the inside i so i have a, i have double i have a i have a double thing i have the main fence to keep out the javelina and sort of deter the rabbits and then i have the fence inside in case the rabbits this hardware cloth in case the rabbits do get in um again just basically what i talked about and one of the things i like about it it's pretty snake friendly i've never had anything caught in hard wire in, in hardware cloth um, I think I might have had a lizard at one point that I was able to rescue, but by and large, it's been pretty safe for wildlife. Uh, I like to use shade cloth in the summer. Um, you might actually use it sometimes, maybe in the late spring, if you're trying to keep things, uh, trying to keep things cool. It can cut down uh, temperatures on your garden 10, 15 degrees, especially good for growing tomatoes and things like that in the summer. This is 50% shade cloth here. A lot of times I put it down. There's a, just a big two inch PVC I use for weight. And then I put uh, just some planks on either side. It's not pretty, uh, but it does the trick and it does keep out birds as, as, and as squirrels especially, which is great. In terms of insects, well, I don't, you don't have a whole lot of problems with insects except aphids in the spring as temperatures start to warm. They really, in past years, they've really hit my Brussels sprouts severely and they've hit my uh, kale severely. And not, they don't seem to bother too much, too many others of the plants, uh, of the other varieties of plants. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons to try to get your garden in as early as possible because kale really likes cool temperatures, especially, and Brussels sprouts too, I think. And if you can get them growing quickly before it starts to warm up uh, in the spring, when you start getting into, into late February and March when the daytime temperatures are starting up, you can maybe beat the aphids. If you have, uh, the ways of dealing with them, if you've got them, you can use a strong blast of water from the hose. This knocks them off, but they're back pretty quick. Uh, two teaspoons of Dawn per quart of water. I just watched a recent YouTube video about somebody who did some experiments with st uh, stink bugs, and they used different concentrations of Dawn dishwashing liquid. A half teaspoon per quart didn't quite kill all of them, but with two teaspoons of Dawn per quart, they pretty much did them in. Not sure how uh, raising this up would do on aphids, but it's something to think about. If you think it's too much uh, Dawn soap, you might try hosing, uh, you might try hosing your plants off afterwards. And neem, I've never actually tried. I've heard a lot about it. Uh, our local grower uh, from Green, uh, from uh, Golden Hill Nursery, Mike Shirley, uses it on his plants, and seems to like it. Harvesting, um, 
again, veggies like lettuce, chard, and broccoli, you can harvest them multiple times. Just cut them off at the base and they will, especially lettuce, will start to come up from the axles there between the leaves and you can get multiple, multiple crops of lettuce. And it actually grows pretty quick. Once it grows, lettuce is slow at first, but once it really gets larger, it starts to grow much, much quicker. Uh, I found too that if I have some plants that die or something happens, something's eaten, I can take plant lettuce plants that are as big as 12, six inches across and still transplant them in, in the winter and they do pretty well. And also you can try staggering in the fall. I don't mean staggering by weeks, but staggering by days. And that'll actually prolong the harvest. Just don't wait too long. Transitioning from a summer garden to a winter garden or vice versa. This one, this one's tough because like right now, I've got a bunch of tomatoes that I'm still harvesting. The plants look kind of yucky, but I've still got a few tomatoes. But right now is really, what is today, the 10th? Right now is when I want to start thinking about getting the garden prepared for growing the winter garden. So what I'm thinking about doing is maybe just doing it in sections, is taking some of the, the least performing, I've got two beds, two four by four beds, is taking the least performing tomatoes, really clearing all those out and preparing that for the winter garden, maybe letting the other bed go maybe another week or so or two, and then clearing that and preparing, preparing it. It's always tough in that transition. And ditto when you get into transitioning from a winter garden to a summer garden, because that's even more important because you don't, you want to get those tomatoes and chill, especially tomatoes in as early as possible after the soil is warm to around 60, 65 degrees. And, uh, and you want them to get in as, and after the last frost, as I was thinking of, you want to get them as quickly as possible be, so they can mature and start producing before it gets so hot and things really start to shut down on them as well. So it's even more important sometimes transitioning to a summer garden to get to maybe dig out some of those winter veggies sooner than you would want to, to get the summer stuff going. And I always try to reinvigorate the mix. Everything settles. I like to reinvigorate the mix with using uh, just commercial amendments. I don't really make much, I mean, I used to do, make all my own compost fanatically. I used to get hundreds of bags of leaves from one of our local landscapers. I used to shovel my own manure, do the whole thing. I just kind of don't do that anymore. So uh, I use commercial uh, steer manure compost. Worm castings are great. Uh, you have to order those online. I've never seen them in a nursery before. And then a fresh application of fertilizer. Don't really dig everything up. Don't rototill it. Try to keep the, the strata because the biological organisms just sort of arrange themselves and you don't want to dig things up too much. One of the old things they used to teach was biodynamic French intensive gardening. One of the things, I, that's what I cut my teeth on and what John Jevons teaches in that book I recommended. And that was, that was one of those really important things is not disturbing the, the biome that's sort of created in the soil. Of course, remove your irrigation tubing first and then reinstall it. And here are just some quick resources uh, where I got the stuff that I've used. And uh, this is gonna be recorded so you'll be able to see this slide. This is the, just some of the places where I've gotten the stuff that uh, I've used. And there we go. I hope I made it in 30 minutes. You did very well. It is 1138, so just three Ooh, minutes. A little over, so little over. I am not complaining whatsoever. Very good. I don't think any of our participants are complaining. I'm going to stop the sharing here. So we've got Kim and I up here. So we're going to start the chat box. And you got questions, you got the expert right here. So while you're putting some questions into the chat box, I'm going to pull up a, a quick poll for us, please. I get a lot of help from uh, Paul Wolterby getting this into the newspaper and Facebook and just want to get a feel for how people hear about this and how that may change from topic or what or just as this webinar series matures. I mean, when I came out the first week, nobody, nobody knew about it, <laughs> so, but now it's getting a little bit of renown. Um, got quite a few of these in here. I can see the questions popping into the chat box here. Um, let me see, I'm gonna pull up, <clears throat> looks like this is slowed down here. I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll unless somebody wants to really hit that in there before. That's a good representative portion here. I'll share that quickly. So, pretty even split there. Um, the emails and the newspaper and Facebook and some people said how they got it otherwise and entered into the chat box. Um, about that listserv, 
uh, just put your email into the chat box or send me an email and I'll just add you that to it and that way you know what we're up to each week. All right. Close that down. Open this up and we had a little levity here. Susan asked, where are you, Kim? She loves that background. He, he wishes he was there. It's just on the island of, from... of Moria, which is right off of, of Papit uh, Tahiti. Yeah, you can see the wind blowing in his hair and his eye tie next to him there. No, I've got, I have hair gel, Chris, so it's not. <laughs> um, Sherry <laughs> Simmons asked, how do you take soil temperatures? The best way is with a soil thermometer, and which I don't have. I used to. I used to have all this stuff when I was like hardcore into it. Um, I used a bulb thermometer that I have on my house. And what I did was I took it and I buried it about four inches deep. And I packed the soil around it real tightly so that uh, I could get the best reading I could. And I left it in there for about a half an hour. And that was the reading I got. And I, I'm, I'm confident that it, uh, it was probably accurate with, you know, plus or minus 5%. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, it was close. And plus, you know, you always have to pass the reasonability test. Does 76 degrees sound about right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I imagine the, the, the soil temperature probes are inexpensive and you can grab those at any hardware store online. Yeah, I saw one on Amazon yesterday. I was looking it up for 18 bucks. Yeah. All right, next question from Beth. Kahananui, would the winter garden be possible at 5,000 feet? We are in Payson, thanks. And I'm just, if you go ahead and answer that, but I yeah, can I mean, respond to that. My, my, I cut my teeth back during the whole 1980s at 4,600 feet. And we were in a bowl and um, the air settled. I mean, we lost the apple crop, I don't know, maybe every three to four years I mean, before my time, but because a cold air would settle down there. So it was a particularly, it was a particularly cold area. And I never used any plastic on that garden, but I did use something called Rime. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's like a spun bond polyester type material. I haven't used it. And I was asking, actually gonna ask you that question and why you're using plastic as opposed to Rime. And then you also have your dark shade cloth because the Rime will still do the same thing. Yeah, well, I didn't have any Rime, I used to. And one of the things that happened to it is the rats ate it in my shed. <clears throat> and also mm -hmm. saw in my notes too, the grasshoppers will also eat through Rime. And then in fact, the notes that I showed there on the slide, uh, one of the things that I said in there was that grasshoppers ate through the Rime. Plastic is, is, a much better, is, is much better at retaining heat, obviously. It's also much better at transmitting light, but it's also much harder to manage the, the, you know, the buildup heat inside. So I would say if you're at 5,000 feet, I would plan on having a way to deploy plastic just because I think you're gonna be more successful, uh, especially you know, during some cold snaps and it'll, it'll accelerate growth too. And it'll just keep things kind of like you know, tight as a bug in a rug. And um, to me, and it might keep some snow off of them too as well. You, know? uh, you want rains, so you wanna make sure to open it up when it's raining. But, I like to use plastic, it just gives me more control. It's like a green, any greenhouse. I mean, that's why they're greenhouses. Right. They, they give you control. And I, I just want to let Beth know that um, the Payson Community Garden is an excellent resource to learn about anything with gardening in the Payson area and how to be successful. You've got people very active there in gardening. Um, and mm -hmm. the winter garden is definitely possible there. And now is the time to get those plants started as Kim was just discussing, you know. Um, we weren't expecting as much of a cool down we just had with this last uh, weather system that came in, but it's gonna creep back up there and um, good time to get started. Yeah, September, um, the daytime temperatures can sometimes stay really high all the way through the month, but the nighttime temperatures regularly, dependably drop, which is kind of cool. Well, it makes it much more comfortable. Rosemary Berg asked about other cool weather herbs. And so I really like the idea of being able to go on my back, back porch and grab cilantro and grab parsley because I'm cooking. It's like, well, that's what I need. It's right there and it's fresh. So any other ideas about cool weather herbs? I don't, you know, just about 
I think in Globe, at least, you know, we're again, we're, well, we, we consider Globe to be 3,500, but actually um, it's a lot of places are more like 3,200, depends on where you're at. It's a whole kind of a, it's a, it's a large area with a lot of different uh, elevations. My house, I think, is probably more like 3,600 because I'm up on the, on the side of a hill. Uh, but almost, most Medit classic Mediterranean herbs uh, are hardy at our elevation. And I mean, when, I, when we're talking about the, the typical culinary herbs, when you're talking about the thymes and the sages and, um, and the, the oreganos and um, I lost, I, I managed the herb garden at the Arboretum for the whole time I was there. And we, I rarely saw, never saw any, any frost damage on any sort of the classic culinary herbs. So I think it's worth, at this elevation, I think you can grow anything. The, the more tender, the, you know, the, the annuals, like Chris was talking about, the, the parsleys and the cilantros and things, uh, those are, you know, those are pretty much, what happens is they, they bolt, they go to, you know, they, they flower and then they sort of lose their culinary uh, attributes, so to speak. But what's nice about all the other herbs is that they, you can carry them all the way through the summer. And I didn't um, mention about Swiss chard. I, you can carry Swiss chard all the way through the summer too, at least with shade. That's one you don't have to necessarily replant. So I, I think I forgot to mention that. And Rosemary, that's a thought I've had is to do a webinar on just the Mediterranean herbs that are so easy to grow in our location here. Um, and so having what he just mentioned, the oreganos, marjoram, rosemary, you know, just having that available in the backyard when you're cooking, it's just a lot of fun. And so that, I may be doing a presentation like that later in the year or sometime yeah. next year. Rosemary is a great landscaping plant too. And it, it's one of those plants that takes severe pruning and, and like leucophyllums do and, and doesn't seem to affect it. You can't cut it back really hard. Will kill it. Uh, Leucophyllums, you know, Texas Rangers, you can cut down to the ground and I'll come back. But rosemary will take sort of mild shearing, um, you know, hmm. forever. Really a tough oh. plant. Okay, I've got many questions here. We're gonna, we are gonna close down at noon as, uh, as Kim, Kim, we've got some, somewhere to go. Next question from Susan I have planted carrots, radishes, turnips, broccoli, and cauliflower. All are in pots. They get a lot of sunshine sun all day is this good i think she's got she's got it together right well i mean it's there definitely you definitely want full sun not necessarily in in july or august but i think as things are cooling off a little bit you can uh, i assume these things are in pots you're getting ready to plant them is that i i think that she's saying she's already got her winter garden ready because those oh. are all winter crops and she's yeah. got and she's growing them in her pots Full yeah. sun. Okay, I see. I, I got it now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the beauty about pots too is that you can always move them. And again, yep. most plants in general, in my experience, just from my experience working at the Arboretum, is that they really max out on sunlight. I mean, when you say full sun, when, a, when something says full sun in a nursery catalog or seed, seed packet or whatever, a lot of times they're not talking about Arizona full sun. And, you know, you can max out a, a full sun at, at six or seven hours. And I mean, these plants have every bit of the sun they can possibly use. And the everything, everything else is just sort of waste heat that they have to get away from. So I would say on, 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 in terms of plants, in terms of container plants, uh, if you feel like they're getting too much sun, move them, just move them into shade or move them where they can get shade for more of a part of the day. Very good. Crystal Ringer mentions the next door garden group. Not sure what that's about, but I imagine it maybe a local um, support group for gardeners. Uh, but thanks for sharing that. Uh, Cindy H says she's actively searching Master Gardener website for mental stimulation education during the COVID. So gardening is great for just taking care of yourself while we're isolating and spending time at home. Got more time to spend time with, with it. Um, oh, th these are probably different questions that I had. These are where they heard about this. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm getting down here to some, to, to some more questions. Um, all right, what do you do for your pill bugs? Donna Martinson's had a problem with pill bugs. <clears throat> well, what I did with my pill bugs is I roasted them. I didn't eat them, but I roasted them. <laughs> I used a torch. 
<laughs> so oh, it's a, little, a little propane. I don't know how I don't know how painless it is, but it's quick, and uh, it it can get rid of hundreds really fast. Okay, and <laughs> well, think about and think about what an insecticide does to an animal. I mean, it is a long, painful death. With at least with the flame, it's boom, 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 and it's they never know what hit them. So to me, it and, seems. Seems but, kind and of, you just gathering by hand and putting them into soapy water does the job too. Yeah, or get yourself a turkey. But it's a lot more fun using fires. So I, I understand. <laughs> and Joe Bullock asks, um, found the webinars by searching, oh, sorry, this is how I found out about the program. Uh, doesn't plastic do more harm than good in near freezing temperatures? Wouldn't cloth be better during freezing temperatures? Asked Steve. Well, to me, if it's an insulator, and um, I mean, it's not an insulator as much as it's a solar insulator, so to speak. Uh, it's it's certainly not. It's certainly very transparent to infrared, but it 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 contains the heat enough that it forms a, a, a an artificial blanket environment. And I don't. To, to me, I I think the biggest thing that you should be concerned about plastic in the winter is getting things too hot. And you have to be really careful about that. You don't want things to get crazy hot in there. But to me, to kind of move things along, because it, it helps decrease the, the air temperature and like that chart I showed you, helps to increase the soil temperature and just keeps plants growing faster. And so I've, I've had good luck with it. What thickness, thickness of plastic do you use and how long does it last you? Oh boy, I hate using plastic. Um, it's really one of those things that drives me crazy. I try to, I try to extend it, you know, a couple of years. And I think I just you get an expensive plastic that is kind of a balance. You don't want to get the stuff like you use, like, you know, one mil type stuff, but you don't need six mil. And so somewhere around the three mil mark, something that'll last you a couple of years. And I always put slats in the top of mine to allow heat to, to dissipate. And I've kind of learned about you know, what, what size holes to use and kind of what to cut into them. And I put it right up at the crown, you know, of the, of the plastic to allow. Um, and sometimes I'll lift the sides, you know, so that the sides are just lifted all the way around. So there's air sort of moving in, but the plastic still kind of is warming that air that's, that's within it and keeping it, keeping it kind of there without the wind and everything moving it away. But yeah, I mean, plastic, I hate using it, but, um, that's that's what I use. I just use inexpensive plastic that's large enough to cover it. Not so cheap that you only get one season out of it, though. You know, try to get something you do multiple seasons out. Good. Yeah, okay. that's what I was thinking. Because I know plastic, you can have a little longer life with it and just try to make it work and just take good care of it. Yeah. Okay. So you can AJ. Use it when you're painting, you can use it as a ground cloth. There you go. Yeah, recycle it as best you can. MJ asks, what strain of tomato works best in our winter garden? And I think that at our elevation and above, we're not having tomatoes in the winter garden, but in the Phoenix area and so on, I know they can get away with that. Are you able to respond to that or we just go to the next question? No, I, I, I fight with tomatoes every year. I mean, I, you know, it's not something I'm really, I have really good years sometimes and I have really bad years. And Phoenix is a whole nother ball of wax in terms yeah. of gardening and timing. And, Practically nothing that I've discussed today applies at, at a thousand feet of elevation. You can grow a winter garden there just fine. Everything you said about your winter garden is good. Can but I, I just I just mean the timing of everything. Yeah. You know. And the, yeah. And, and just how quickly. I mean, the winters are just the cool season is so short in Phoenix, and and it stays hot longer, and it and it gets warm quicker, and you have just like this really small window to make everything happen, you know, before it just burns up. And it's like, you know, I guess talk to some farmer in Yuma. I mean, that's, that would be the best thing to do because that's where, what, what what's the percentage, 3% of our U.S. lettuce comes out of Yuma every, every winter? Something the, whole, like the, the world salad bowl in, Jan, in January. Yep. Yeah. So Donna Martinson just makes the comment that neem is thick, oily, and clogs up the sprayer. So she hasn't had a good experience with it. I, I know other people like neem a lot. Um, yeah. Carol Schumacher says she misses you, if you remember Carol. She says she's on a hilltop in Queen Valley, about 2,300 feet. Our garden seems to be relatively about the same as BTA blooming. 
shall I wait a little bit longer since we are still warm at this elevation? I'm going to say, no, go ahead and start. But what do you say? Yeah, you know the way September goes is we're all sick of the summer. And <laughs> it just stays hot and hot. And the daytime temperatures are just, they're just crazy. And it's got to have cooled down. But if you look at the nighttime temperatures, they're, they're consistently going down. And even right now, we're supposed to go back up in the valley, I think, you know, up into the mid 100s. But this, look at the nighttime temperatures. I mean, they're, they're, they're down, way down from where they were. And I think finally, at towards the mid to end of September, temperatures always drop. It might go into the first week of October, but eventually it will drop. And that's when, that's why you want to try to have things in. If you need to shade them right now, maybe you can put them in early and try to shade them as well. And, and germination of seed goes, goes faster with warmer soil as long as it's not too hot. Um. I'd really love to be able to get some of those uh, temperature ranges that you were mentioning and be able to share that with uh, this presentation when I post it. I've shared the uh, 10 steps to a successful garden, which is the ULA extension bulletin, which has some planting times in, um, in Arizona by elevation, but doesn't answer the same question. You know, it's kind of like when to plant in the spring and we want to know what are the temperatures so we can plant in the winter. So, you know, I've got a whole library of books that are, you know, they're written by, um, who was the, um, I've forgotten everybody's name now, who, who was the famous extension agent from Pima County that was there forever? Um, Terry Michael? No, he was, he was Phoenix. Well, he was in Yuma originally. Um, who was? Uh, Brookbank, George Brookbank. Oh, George Brookbank, yes. He wrote, he wrote Sorry. several books about gardening in Tucson, which is, you know, roughly 2,400 feet. And, and I've got a couple of those books, but you know, if you wanted to, to post something after the fact, I could try to uh, either, I, I could look in some of these and see if I could find that information. I'll, very good. And I'll see if I can find it too, because I was just, it, it is, it's like just timing the, timing the temperature and each of us are in a different place where that's different. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah. Moving over to the question and answer section, CKB says, do you rotate your crops in your boxes? You know, I was going to mention that it's really hard to do it. Um, I know you're supposed to, and I thought about uh, building another box, another relatively small box. My old boxes used to be four feet wide by 12 inches, let's see, four feet wide by 12 feet long. And I had two of them side by side. I mean, I, again, this was 30 years ago when I was just crazy about doing this kind of thing. And, and I've just pared it down so much that all I have now is two roughly 20 square foot boxes. And they're four and a half by four and a half, something like that. And it just isn't practical to kind of let one of them rest if I want to actually grow anything in them. So what I'm doing right now is just trying to get all the old plants out of there, trying to reinvigorate the soil, like I mentioned in the slide, uh, you know, getting more, a lot more organic matter in there, trying to get more fertilizer in there. Uh, gets, and I noticed that one Job's fertilizer I didn't mention has mycorrhizae in it. I just noticed that this year. So that's a good, good soil inoculant if you can get a hold of that fertilizer. And just try to do the best I can and see how things shake out. Good, good. Got just a couple more questions here. We're coming on noon. Um, Galaxy Tab asks, I have a fish tank. If I take the water from the tank and use the water directly on the plants, then should the water be diluted? Ooh. I thought you were going to say, can you use it on your garden? I don't That's know. That's what he asked. Yeah, he said, just can, can yeah, you pour, well, you know, plant. If you, if you dilute it, um, it'll spread out more and it'll cover more soil volume, but it'll be at less concentration. I, don't know, I guess it just depends on how green he lets the water get, right? Uh, <laughs> well, it should have a lot of nitrogen in it. I mean, pond water is actually pretty fresh. Yeah. Um, I used to irrigate with pond water when I lived at the top of the world, and just because I had read that. I had, there was a nutrient analysis somewhere about pond water, about how much nitrogen it had. But yeah, I, I mean, would, I guess I would experiment with it. I would be a little concerned about possible pathogens, but um, I think as long as he's putting it directly onto the soil and letting that dry before he does his harvest and wash, he should be fine. Yeah, yeah, it'd be, it'd be fine. I mean, a lot of times you learn things just by experiment. And you can, you know, if you think something's going to work, well, divide it up into three different do one straight, do one at 25% dilution, 50%, half and half, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, see if there's, do it on the same exact plant. 
you know, see if you've got four different four different plants and see how they how they're affected, assuming they're far enough apart. There you go. Have fun with it. That's yeah. The have answer. Fun. <laughs> um, make sure to refill says, the food tank when you're done, though. I'm from Phoenix and wonders if there's a similar webinar for her elevation and climate. I imagine we could ask the Maricopa Master Gardeners if they want to do this. Um, but I think particularly, if Judy, if we can get you some information about those um, soil temperatures and nighttime temperatures, you can time it for when to do your winter garden in the Phoenix area. And as Kim mentioned, just kind of a shorter growing season, which gets in the way. But I think there's still plenty of time to get some good crops growing down there as, as I do in Yuma. So we can certainly I, I would it. think really the only thing you can do in Phoenix is probably to get things in earlier somehow because the heat is going to, heat's going to kill you uh, faster in the spring, I think, than it is in the winter. That's just a guess. I, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, excuse me, it's going to kill you quicker as if you're coming out of the winter garden than it is coming out of the summer garden. Uh, because it's sort of a, it's a very gradual thing as, as we're coming out of, of the summer, but it's a really fast in your face kind of warm up in the spring. You can get hot really fast. Okay, last question. And I'm going to go ahead and pop up the uh, webinar evaluation survey again here. So if people have stuck with us to the end, please go op open up that form slot GLE, the Google thing, and just give me some input. Quest Susan says, how do you get rid of snails? You, do, can you use the flamethrower? <laughs> there was a lady in Globe, uh, Eloise McNulty. And anybody that's been has anything knows Globe. She was she was what she's the reason that that any that anybody has anything planted in their yard. Uh, she was a great horticulturist, great nursery woman. Loved everybody loved her. Uh, she's been gone for many years now. But I used to watch her go through, and she would just she was very dispassionate about it. When she saw a snail, she just picked it out, put it under her foot without even breaking stride. It was just pick and crunch, pick and crunch, pick and crunch. It was just a fact of life. So just stay on top of them. Yeah. All right. There's, you know, there's different kinds. Of, yeah, just stay or st have them stay under you. <laughs> yeah, stay on top of them. That was right the first time. Exactly. All right. We're going to close this down here. Kim, thank you so much for today's uh, webinar. Um, look for the uh, webinar evaluation in the chat box. We've just had our Q&A. I want to show our uh, closing slide here to put a little plug in for next week. Um, our next webinar on Thursday, September 17th at 11 a.m. in Arizona. So it's always 11 a.m. in Arizona. Um, Kevin McCulley is our fuels manager for the city of Payson. And he's going to be talking about Payson's new, whoops, I put Payson in twice, Payson's new fire adapted community plan town code webinar. So they have a new Firewise Town Code in Payson. Just got it um, approved by the council a few weeks ago. Um, and just gonna talk about what that means for residents in Payson. But also, I think any of our communities who are being affected by wildfire, and that includes us in Globe Miami now, um, we might learn a lot on what it takes to for a community to be prepared for wildfire. So with that, I'm going to hit the end recording and thank you so much for joining us and see you all next week.